Welcome to episode two of this case discussion series. Uh, I'm Phil Weinberger, and in this video, we're going to be chatting with Dr. Scott Gans. So, in this video, Dr. Gans is going to be talking about malpositioned implants and what his approach is for these types of cases. It's going to be a bit more generalized. We'll likely do a part two to this video uh, where he'll go in much more depth into each specific treatment plan and what his approach is and actually going through the actual treatment plans together. Dr. Gans is a maxillofacial prosthodontist and he became one of the first surgical prosthodontists to begin placing implants in the United States. He's extremely well published with over 125 articles. <laughs> Not to mention, just a good guy. So, hope you enjoy the video. If you do, consider subscribing and let's get to it. Okay, Scott Gans, welcome. Thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Well, it's always a pleasure to uh, to talk to you and to meet with our our colleagues uh, over the airways. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So um, I thought um, we can get started a little bit. I think it's uh, good just to kind of explain a little bit about what you're doing at uh, at your Park Forty location in Manhattan. I know a lot of these cases that we're going to discuss, or some of these cases, or all of our will will come from there. So you guys are doing some amazing things there. Why don't you talk a little bit about that real quick? Sure. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we we had uh, lots of things going on for lots of people, as we all know. And uh, I have a practice in, in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And I spent half of my time in my practice and half of my time running around the world giving lectures. And then uh, the pandemic hit and that kind of uh, came to a screeching halt. And so uh, one, one of my uh, dear friends from many, many years ago asked me to kind of help him out with some things, uh, which ended up turning into uh, opening a full arch uh, implant center in the middle of Manhattan. And so we've, we've called that Park 40. Actually, we've recently changed our address as well. So now we're on the Upper, upper East Side. And, and almost everything that we do is full arch implant restoration reconstruction. And one of the first things that I did was to say um, uh, we need like the best comb beam CT you know that we can get because everything is going to be based upon uh, proper diagnosis and treatment planning and we were uh, fortunate to be able to uh, to stay with the same unit that I have in my Fort Lee office which is the the care stream the CS 9600 and uh, we put that one in our uh, Manhattan location and it's been absolutely fantastic uh, I can't even tell you how many scans we take every day, yeah. and uh, we've been able to merge that with all of our other technology, including, of course, our intraoral scanners and the facial scan, and it, it's really been great. Nice. So basically, you know, all we do is, is uh, for the most part, um, full arch implant reconstruction. And so, so that's great. And I would imagine, like the topic that we're going to be talking about mostly today, is going to be fixing implants, basically fixing previously placed implants, what um, what percentage of the cases you guys see is really based on fixing previously placed, placed implants versus just, you know, net new types of cases? Well, that, it, that's kind of an interesting question. And, and I just had this conversation with one of my oral surgery friends. And um, you know, first of all, we, we, we have a team um, over over in Manhattan. You know, I, I actually do all of the surgery and my my a uh, fellow colleague and, and uh, teammate, uh, Dr. Fischler, as well as uh, we have other surgeons, Dr. Cho, we have Dr. Khan, um, and we, we work as a team to be able to bring our patients back to uh, the, the uh, aesthetics and function that they desire. And many times our patients come in uh, having had implants, uh, of course, by someone else or some other facility. It could have been done recently. It could have been done five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And as we know, Phil, and as you know, the, the, the patient population uh, that has been receiving implants now for the last 20, 30, 40 years uh, with, with the kind of the new implants that we have today, the uh, root form uh, osseo-integrated type implants, uh, 
they are philosophies have changed and you know some are some clinicians as as you well know are still not placing implants with the use of advanced technology like 3d imaging and so therefore we see people that uh, have placed implants that may be what i call malpositioned and i'll try to be nice with that they're malpositioned meaning they they really can't be restored uh, or uh, they are um, in a in a uh, they've had bone loss that has um, you know created either soft tissue inflammation and and uh, infection type complications and therefore they they have to be removed sure. and so so we are left we are left with a, a situation where uh, we have to discuss with the patient the the um, uh, the options that they have to be able to correct what they present with. And so I've been actually collecting um, a bunch of cases and I, I, I'm, I'm actually even thinking of, of doing a textbook at this point because we've collected so many cases. But the, the interesting thing uh, is that you have uh, a, a situation where we are dealing with uh, implants of all different types all different sizes, all different brands. So we're not we're not talking about any particular brand. We're really talking about philosophy, um, whether they're placing implants flapless, whether they're placing implants guided or non-guided. All of this plays into why um, these patients are now coming to us sure. with these issues. Okay, okay. Um, what percentage roughly of the cases that you're doing today are guided? Um, well, actually, you know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't answer your first question in terms of percentage, and that's so. It's about, I, I would say, it's, it's getting to be more than twenty percent of what I do is, is in some way removing implants okay. that, uh, that have uh, complications, and in terms of guided, um, I would say it's in the high eighty percent of mm. the cases we're, we're doing guided, and I'm still. Uh, designing and uh, we do our own 3D printing uh, of our guides for every case. Uh, and there's occasional cases where we're doing some advanced work like guided small chrome where we're, we're right. using working with Rho Dental Lab and we're doing some wonderful stackable type guides with metal frameworks and being able to load the, the case the same day. Got it. Okay. Well, let's let's jump into it. Let's go over a few of these cases and kind of understand your approach and how you kind of uh, look at these types of cases and what you do and, and go and jump into it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to segue for a minute to uh, to a couple of slides, which I think are going to be uh, educational. So uh, just on philosophy, so this is now uh, over 10 years old. This is from 2012, and this is the position statement of our specialty within uh, implant, uh, I'm sorry, within the American Dental Association from the uh, AAOMR, the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Radiology, on the use of, of radiology with um, specifically an emphasis on cone beam. And, you know, it's, it's I, I would love to be able to say I don't have to show this slide anymore, but because this is from 2012, but specifically the AAOMR, and I was very privileged and honored to be a co-author on this paper. They basically recommend that cross-sectional imaging be used for the assessment of all dental implant sites and that cone beam CT is the imaging method of choice. Here we are in 2023 now, and unfortunately this is not the case. I mean, it's it's growing for sure. And as you know, Phil, um, and as CareStream knows, there's a you know, growing population of, of uh, clinicians that have adopted the technology for sure. But then there's the missing link, and the missing link is, are you just taking the cone beam CT, or what are you doing with it after you take it? I mean, how uh, much time are you spending analyzing and diagnosing and treatment planning? And this, to me, is still the weakest area in implant dentistry today. And so when we, when we think about the fact that we have uh, a tremendous adaptation uh, you know, in the US and worldwide, uh, of the use of cone beam CT, in my opinion, and having been working with this for now for almost 40 years, I can tell you that um, that the world of 3D imaging is still lacking 
in its in its uh, penetration as far as uh, coming up with true protocols of how to plan cases, which we'll, which we'll talk about as I go through some cases. Yeah. And so so as I always say that, that you know, the, the treatment success is based upon proper diagnosis and proper uh, and, and comprehensive treatment planning. And that three dimensional imaging or cone beam CT is the absolute foundation is the foundation from which everything else is based upon. So it we still have so many clinicians that are using panoramic radiographs and you know, you just cannot appreciate a, a patient's anatomy uh, in terms of vital adjacent structures or bone density or any of that information without a really good comb beam CT it, it, yeah. and 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 interactive treatment planning software. It's it's becoming more rare <clears throat> where I run into you know, uh, practitioners that are not using CBCT, but I but I do still run into it. Um, for sure. Um, fortunately, it is rare uh, today than it used to be, of course. Yeah, so, and then, you know, then we have the other part of the equation, and that is that we've had, we, we've now been able to implement and, and merge together the other, you know, incredible advances in, in the dig digital workflow, such as intraoral scanners, uh, desktop scanners, facial scanning, and many of the other um, incredible advancements in, in 3D printing, which allows us to, to, again, the foundation is the comb beam CT. And yeah. then we move into bringing all the other technologies uh, in, into, into play. If, I, if we take a look at a situation like this, where we have taken the maxilla out of the view, we're just looking at the patient's mandible. This is the lingual view. Now, of course, a panoramic radiograph can't possibly show a three-dimensional reconstructed volume uh, of, a, of a lower arch or an upper arch. And this view is something that sometimes we don't even pay attention to. If you take a look at the, the, the where the inferior alveol alveolar nerve enters the, the lingual part of the mandible, um, these, these are important parts of the anatomy. And oftentimes, we're, we're not even looking in this area at all. And so if you take a look now at the at the buckle view or anterior view, we can see where the mental foramens are on either side, and we can see that these teeth are, you know, fairly uh, well positioned outside the bone, and therefore we can start to diagnose and treatment plan if we were going to do a full arch uh, extraction case and do an alveolectomy, level the bone, and be able to place implants in between the two mental foramens because obviously there's no bone posteriorly. And as we start to, to view uh, each one of these images in the different contexts, we can appreciate the adjacent structures and, of course, the position of the teeth. So one of the other features of, of the 3D imaging software that's the, in part of the CareStream 3D imaging is really advanced as the metal artifact reduction. And as you can see, there's a lot of scatter in these images. And sometimes we would just love to be able to remove that scatter. And as you can see, it really does clean up the image, helps us to evaluate where there's some issues here. You can see the pathology around an impacted tooth. And then we have to deal with the, um, the scatter from the metal of the crowns that are pre-existing. And as you can see, where we're turning it on and turning it off, it makes a very big difference in the visualization, as you can see here in the axial view as well. And so these are advanced tools that help our, the diagnostic process. And this is uh, part of the 3D imaging software for CareStream. And that's very unique and it's really very, very helpful in being able to help us to appreciate the patient anatomy better, especially when we have these metal artifacts that cause this tremendous scatter. How often are you using the MAR? Are you using it pretty often, especially with previously placed implants, I would imagine, going yeah, to, I, to want to use that for sure. Absolutely. I, I think that part of the process is that, you know, we actually have areas that are totally masked by the scatter and we cannot appreciate that anatomy. And therefore, it's an invaluable tool when you have, you know, patients that come in with existing bridge work, as you can see in this particular case. 
And so where it becomes important as well is that, you know, we have to be able to um, utilize our intraoral scanners and merge the data sets together. And when we when we're we're trying to assess whether or not those um, uh, the intraoral scan uh, imaging and the and the 3D imaging from the from the 3D from the comb beam CT is accurate. And you can't really tell if you just have this, you know, w w whited out area. It's impossible yeah. to be able to see. If you're if you're using, you know, a points matching system to to merge the STL and and the DICOM, and it's you know uh, a full mouth of, of of implants or zirconia, like it's going to be impossible to 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 find those exact points for sure. And that can be very frustrating because that's like one of the major features uh, of of our of our software to be able to uh, bring in the the better uh, imaging for surface area for surface texture uh, such as trying to capture the occlusal surfaces of the teeth you need the intraoral scan data because comb beam ct is was never designed to pick up that surface detail which you can get uh, from the uh, intraoral scan and we need that when we're especially when we're doing uh, surgical guides. The surgical guide fabrication is absolutely, it's absolutely imperative that we have a clean surface to be able to design the guide and fabricate the guide. So as an example, um, when we're trying to do these full arch cases and, and patients come in looking like this, and we are trying to assess uh, the sites for potential implant placement, we need to be able to understand the anatomy. And again, a panoramic radiograph will never show this middle image, which shows the area on the lingual surface, which which actually comes in like a V, and leaves us with almost very little uh, uh, bone to be able to either place an implant or even think about augmenting, because that's on the side of the tongue. So how do you graft in that area? Now in the left image, we can we can level the bone, we can we can flatten it out gaining width for an implant placement below the apex of the tooth. But in this particular middle image, you can't do that because we're seeing normal anatomy for this particular patient, but it's certainly not the kind of anatomy that we want to have when we're trying to place implants. So you can see it on the 3D uh, reconstructive view here on the right side. And so all of these uh, images just illustrate the absolute importance of having 3D imaging for the diagnosis and treatment planning. And this can also explain why we have implants that are malpositioned because we're not appreciating uh, this, this anatomy. And so implants are often placed in the same trajectory as the tooth rather than the uh, position that we really need it to be surrounded by bone and to have the ultimate restorative outcome because right. our patients are coming to us because they want teeth, uh, not, not because uh, they want implants. So here's so here's a uh, uh, one of those cases, as you can see here. The patient came in with three implants in the in the mandible, and uh, they're uh, clearly not in a restorable position. Once we start to evaluate uh, all these different uh, views, and we can see that this was for an overdenture, and you know, for an overdenture, we really need to have the implants as close to parallel as possible. So the process, we have a prosthesis draw so that the, the denture snaps into place for a removable type desired outcome. And of course, in this case, not only are we missing that parallelism, but we have you know, a, a lot of bone loss and we have to really try to assess this type of a case to understand um, how we can correct this. Because now the patient already spent money, already went through at least one surgery. I believe that there was also a, a fourth implant that was placed somewhere uh, on the uh, low right side and, and, and is no longer there. And so how do we even approach, um, you know, uh, the patient to explain what's going on? And basically, in, in some of these cases, uh, the bone loss could be so extensive that we have to do major grafting first. And in other cases, it's because of the maybe misdiagnosis that we can actually find good sites to place new implants. Hmm. Are you are you able to to uh, to salvage any of the, the the implants in these types of cases? Or are you pretty much just uh, removing all of them and kind of starting from scratch? 
Well, as you can see from this um, image, case by case, obviously, I would imagine. Yes, it's absolutely. And, and if you, you see this image, you can see where there's bone loss around uh, the left and right implant and also the posterior implant. And this is a situation where you really can't uh, salvage the, the implants themselves um, or, or continue to use them in, in a restorative uh, in the restorative future. And so in a situation like this, one of one of my uh, the, the caveats here is that it's it's best to be able to understand which implant these are, which in, implant manufacturer, because almost I would say 80 to 90 percent of the time, if you know the implant manufacturer, you know what the connection is. If you don't have a surgical kit for that particular implant, you can order a driver that will fit inside the implant. You remove these happen to be, you know, locator type attachments. You remove those attachments. You place your driver in the implant and you reverse torque it and you don't have to do any further damage to the to the bone. However, in some cases you have to use, uh, you know, one of the rescue kits or or use trephine burrs that would fit over the implant and then you actually have to remove bone in order to get these implants out. Mm. So it's, it is a case by case basis and that's one of the things that we have to uh, understand that um, we, we try to preserve as much as we can, certainly, but in many cases we don't have that luxury. Okay, okay so, he, so here's, here's the actual case with the, with the DICOM data. And one of the things that I, I just want to emphasize that when, we, when we're looking at, at these images, of course, you, you want to be able to interact with these images. You want to be able to, to, to utilize the tools that are inherent in, in any of the software that you may choose to use. And, and certainly the, the CareStream software is, is, is our starting point to be able to analyze this. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, how many things that uh, are, are possible to be able to do uh, by, by using some of the features such as, you know, narrowing down the region of interest so that we can cut out some of the extraneous things. Uh, as you can see on the, on the, on the left side of the screen, where we can we can remove some of the the um, the other areas such as the maxilla in this case, so we can zoom in uh, on on the areas uh, of real uh, interest or the region of interest, and so you know of course the other thing that we want to be able to do is we want to be able to uh, really understand where the nerve uh, traverses and and uh, Phil you've done a fabulous job. Uh, producing so many wonderful videos on YouTube. Um, I don't want to waste any time talking about the uh, how we do that uh, at this point. But as you can see, if I can, let me just zoom in on this for a second. Here we go. Um, if I zoom in on, on this nerve, we can see that there's not a lot of um, room if we want to just make an incision and create a flap, there's a danger of, of hitting that nerve because it's just sitting right on top or very close to being on top of, of the ridge itself. Um, and then when you're asking me, can we salvage these implants? Now you can have a better understanding here uh, that there's almost no uh, part of that implant which is, is in the bone. So we've got like 85% of this implant is sitting in air. So we always kind of wonder how these implants actually are staying in. Right. Um, the other nice feature about the, the CareStream software is when we when we start to move this um, our, our cursor around and we try to, you know, understand the trajectory of these implants, if I move my this blue line back and forth, you can see that it's it's actually you know perpendicular to the yellow line or um, which which represents your axial plane. If I then take this blue line and I and I move it so that it actually becomes parallel to the implant, then I have a much better understanding because I'm going right down the center of the implant itself, and we can see that this is really not a, a good situation uh, to try to maintain the implant. So why did this happen? Well, most likely this was done uh, flapless. Um, I'm going to use the measurement tool here just to sh just to paint this line, um, this green line, just to show that angle. 
and most likely that was the angle of the uh, the the um, natural teeth, and so that that implant may have been placed either along the angle of teeth that were extracted, or this was an edentulous case and they just did a flapless and did not place it in the right position. So the question is, what do we do in, in this particular situation? And so um, I'm gonna show a, a, a little video clip of really what we do for, for a patient like this, um, because from here, I can, I can plan to place implants and we can simulate the placement of implants. Okay, so when we're looking at these images, and obviously we can we can start to utilize the tools within the CareStream software, but they, they'll only give us a simulation and will give us an idea of the, let's say the diameter and the size of the implant length that we can place in a particular area. And then we need to utilize our industry partners and with CareStream now we have uh, Blue Sky Plan, uh, which is integrated, can be integrated as, an, uh, as a button within the software and uh, new, uh, the new partnering with the SMOP software, which came out of Europe and also allows us now to take the planning part and the diagnostic part to a different level where we can actually plan the position of the implants, plan for bone reduction, plan everything that we need, and then actually design the surgical guide so that we can move into the world of guided surgery, whether it's uh, diagnostic freehand guides or it's going to be uh, uh, full template guidance with whatever implant company that you're working with and the surgical kits that would come with it. Okay, so here's a little video clip of this case. So we see where the malpositioned implants are. We've moved this into the Blue Sky Plan software and we can actually segment out those implants that are malpositioned. And I couldn't fit four implants here for an overdenture, but we can certainly put three in. We could also have done two. And so I have a slight tripodization of the position of those implants. And we can use what I've termed selective transparency to turn the bone more translucent. And then we can tweak the position of these implants. So you can see that it has a little bit of a tripodization. There's a little bit of the incisive branch of the, of the nerve coming through on that left side. And so we wanna to try to avoid that. Here, we're looking at some bone reduction, we wanna flatten that ridge, and therefore we can position the implants a little bit more accurately uh, and gain some width, and then tweak the position of the implant. And so now if we can it, remove those implants, and by the way, you can see the holes in the bone from where they are, and you can see the, the bone reduction that's needed. And then we can go ahead and design a surgical guide that allow us to position these implants exactly where we have proposed them to be in the simulation. And there's the tripodization. So with, with the combination of the CareStream software and then exporting it in this case to the um, to the um, sorry, to the Blue Sky Plan software, we have the ability to have more and more control out of everything that we do. So on that, um, what I'd like to do is to segue to one more case. Okay. Okay. Actually, a question before you even start this uh, this other case. So when it comes time to to restoring those these types of cases, are you guys or how often? I know you are, but how often are you using the photogrammetry? You're, you're using the iMetrics camera, correct? That's correct. Okay, and then can you explain just to the audience a little bit about what that is? I think that'd be nice to kind of explain and um, I can even show a quick video as you're talking over it, um, but just a quick summary of what that is. Sure. Um, photogrammetry is just an extra extension in, in the use of uh, specialized cameras that use specialized scan bodies, and those scan bodies are then recorded in, in a very, very, very accurate, down to the low microns uh, of accuracy to be able to, instead of taking a real physical impression, an analog impression, um, or using standard scan bodies with intraoral scanner. Um, although with photogrammetry, you do need to have an intraoral scanner as well. So you need both the, the photogrammetry unit 
and you need an inferral scanner because they're go going to uh, capture different types of information. So the photogrammetry uh, unit is able to accurately look at these scan bodies and uh, whether we do it uh, the day of surgery, which we do sometimes, or we do that uh, after the implants are uncovered, um, we uh, are using that technology to be able to be totally uh, digital in, 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 in a very, very, very accurate way. Okay, so uh, one other case here uh, is uh, w one of the more difficult cases actually that, that I've encountered. Uh, this particular patient uh, came uh, over to us with uh, the problem of having also malpositioned implants. And, um, you know, one of the things that I didn't mention uh, initially is that I always like to redraw curves and uh, I, I never trust artificial intelligence. I always like to be able to look at, um, even though we have uh, artificial intelligence now for many of these things, I like to be able to draw my own curves. And, and uh, what I'd like to just show you is that if I take any of these points and, and I move the points, if you look in the upper right hand corner, uh, where the, the panoramic image is, or I can maybe blow this up here. When I move these points, you notice that that panoramic image is going to change. And that really affects your whole entire visualization uh, of the anatomy. So you have to be very, very careful when we're analyzing uh, these, uh, these areas of anatomy, because if we take a look at this uh, panoramic view, and we go right to this spot right here, that happens to be where the mental foramen uh, comes out of the, of the mandible in this particular position. And again, similar to the other case, and this is something that, that uh, does, does happen. Um, so when we're, when we're looking at this again, this nerve is sitting directly on the, almost entirely uh, outside on the buccal area uh, on the crest of the ridge. And so we we ended up having a knife edge ridge as we move through here. And then we pick up these two implants and you can see that there's a locator attachment on it. And we can see where this particular uh, implant may um, be angled again uh, in, a, in a trajectory towards the facial or the buckle. And you can imagine, and I'll take the measurement tool here for a second, if I then created a line like you see here, and that would be my line of uh, where I would reduce the bone. So we can use the CareStream uh, library of implants, place an implant into this area in the proper position. And then if we're going to use SMOP software or the Blue Sky so software, it can actually then pick up the position as we've planned it. Uh, this patient actually came for the upper, believe it or not, she came for the upper jaw first. We did the upper jaw, and uh, we then had to actually convince her that these implants were going to be problematic. Uh, and so we want to, you know, we said, you know, these are not gonna, these are not gonna last long term. And as you can see, again, uh, with the implant that's, that's located more to, on the patient's left side, uh, that angle is even more obtuse and uh, so we were ending up ending up having to uh, replace these malpositioned implants. Did, and she, did she really need much convincing with this? Yeah, no, <laughs> she really did because she just did. She yeah. just didn't want to. Uh, well, two reasons. One, because she didn't want to go through the surgical procedure itself. Yeah. And the second one is because she had some nerve damage on this right side mm. and that was causing her, you know, some some discomfort. And you can see if we if we zoom in on this a little bit more, um, that we have the nerve um, kind of sitting out here and then on the buck um, on the crest of the ridge and then it kind of the density of the bone uh, go, go, go basically is, is is very very thin in that area and so um, we actually transferred this into a full arch fixed case upper and lower and uh, the patient is you know very 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 happy now you'll notice also <laughs> that there, there's these kind of starry uh, white things that are kind of floating around. Well, these are actually uh, markers. Uh, we get them from, uh, they're called shore marks, and we get them uh, from an ancillary company that allows us to uh, uh, basically stick them onto the existing denture. 
And by being able to do that, we have the ability to then scan the denture with the markers on them. It's called the dual scan technique. And we've been doing this for years and years and years. Uh, but now we have, you know, these companies that make these markers mm. so that they become uh, radio opaque. Uh, you can use gutta percha points. You can use composite, radio opaque composite. There's many things that you can do. However, these stick on the denture and then they can be taken off immediately. And the dual scan part is that we scan the patient with the denture in place. And obviously it would have to be a, a, a good fitting denture. Um, and uh, to be and, and stable. And then we scan the denture separately. And, and that's one of the built-in features of the uh, CS9600, the CareStream software. It has actually a setup just for doing that as well as scanning uh, physical models. Okay, so nice. one of the one of the major the one of the major um, perspectives that I, I think uh, that I wanted to share is that as our patient population um, is um, has become uh, knowledgeable about what dental implants can do for them. We also have an issue of uh, that patients are very aware now with social media and all of the you know the, the postings that we see in the videos that mistakes can be made and implants uh, you know can fail. They they may not work. They may not become integrated or they they may be lost. Uh, you know we're dealing with human biology. Uh, and it's very, very important, therefore, that we have and we use the state of the art tools such as our, our comb beam CT to have the best images possible to be able to understand how we utilize these tools, how to plan our cases. And when we have issues with malpositioned implants, oftentimes uh, what I do is a forensic type analysis. And then I said, well, okay, now let's look and see what we can do to correct the problem. And what's wonderful today is that with the advent, especially of 3D printing and our intraoral scanners and the merging of that data together, we're actually able to, uh, it's not really thinking outside the box, but it's utilizing these tools to come up with different solutions. And oftentimes the patient does have enough bone to take these malpositioned implants out, place new implants, and we change the quality of their life. So this is kind of an introduction to that, and, and I'll be happy to come back, Phil, if you, uh, you would uh, invite me back, to be able to then go into a, maybe a little bit more comprehensive uh, way that we can treatment plan and merge this with some of the other software uh, that we utilize today to, to, to facilitate the process. Love it, I love it. Absolutely, we can definitely do that and go into much more, you know, more detail in the actual uh, treatment plan would be great. I'm sure the audience would love to kind of go through that with you and your thought process and what you do and how you do it. Um, so that would be great. This is perfect. This is perfect. That was uh, excellent. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh, it's always my pleasure. And certainly, you know, you can look at some of the social media posts. You can look at our Instagram as well as on Facebook. And, you know, certainly if you want to contact me directly, if you have cases like this, or there are clinicians that are out there listening, um, feel free to contact Phil or, or contact myself. Uh, my email is very easy. It's drgans at drgans.com. And uh, we'll be happy to um, maybe take a look at some of your, your own cases and see if there's a way that we can uh, come up with a solution for you. Perfect. And, and also I'll put links to, in the description to, you know, upcoming surgical courses for Dr. Gans, um, any additional uh, content that he has that can help you guys. So just take a look at that. I'll put it up on the screen as well. All the information he just uh, he just said, so you can take a look and reach out directly or through me either way. And again, I, I appreciate certainly all of what you do, Phil, because you spend so much time uh, creating this content for the for the viewers out there. And for people that uh, you know want to uh, enhance in, enhance their skill set uh, in interpreting comb beam CT data, I really enjoyed your your uh, discussion with Leah, and I hope to see more of that as well. And uh, certainly, I'd be happy to come back anytime. Awesome! Thanks again. I appreciate it. Okay, we'll talk to you. Thanks. Bye bye.